Hi, it's Bert. Um, Sean's making some uh, hot chocolate at the moment. So you might hear some stirring and then you might see her bringing me some hot chocolate in a moment. But I thought I would do a bit of a sort of roundup of what I've read so far this year because I realised I haven't done uh, an end of month wrap up for January or February. Um, oh. It's quite hot. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Cheers, guys. Oh. Having a cocoa moment, um, like in a Hallmark Christmas film. Yeah. Is that nice? This is the Galaxy one. It's not as good as the salted caramel. No, one. it's just divine. Yeah. Fueled by divine. Fueled, fueled by divine. No, it's just called Divine. Oh, Divine. <laughs> um, I'm Bert. Did I say that? I'm Bert. You're Divine. Uh, I'm Divine. Oh, you're watching Pastory Time. Yeah. I've been looking forward to this day. Um, so, yeah, just a quick uh, wrap up of what I've read and what I can remember about them. I, I didn't really want to go around and get all the books out of the stacks and hunt them around the flat. So I'll just put pictures up for all of them. Um, so I started off the year with um, A Room in Chelsea Square. This is by Michael Nelson. This is, I think, an early 60s or late 50s um, book. Uh, it was reissued by Valancourt Press. Um, I really enjoyed it. It was kind of a bit of a camp farce. So it was, um, I think it was kind of well known and was actually quite notorious after its publication for a, you know for a few decades in its portrayal of um, gay men. And it was very sort of open about that, which was quite sort of um, refreshing to read for a book from that time. But then also, I guess, because the characters weren't all, always necessarily likeable and um, to a certain extent were sort of camp stereotypes, um, I think it was disregarded by the gay community for quite a while. And um, I guess now is, again, of social interest. Um, but as just as a as a book, I found it quite fun. Quite um, had a lot of bite to it. It was a bit sort of, of a uh, uh, like a commentary on uh, kind of the kind of rich kind of elders in sort of so set in London um, taking advantage of sort of younger poor street guys, sort of taking them into their lives and then expecting them to basically be um, at their beck and call and to perform for money kind of thing uh, it, was, it was really really good and I liked that it didn't sort of without saying um, that every character in it was gay you kind of knew that they all were um, so it's a really kind of a little bit of a an interesting perspective into that sort of time uh, knowing that that community was th was there and was had like all these kind of um, characters in it but it was, you didn't sort of see it in literature really uh, up until this point uh, so I enjoyed that. I think I gave it like a four out of five. Um, and then I read a poetry book called Speed of Life um, by Michael Strong. I will find out who translated it um, and write it uh, there because I think this is Norwegian. It's Danish actually. Um, so ignore every time I say Norwegian. Uh, poetry. Uh, I heard about this from a friend of mine on Instagram called um, like Picture a Day. Um, and... We have quite sort of a, a sort of crossover music taste, let's say. Um, she's really into sort of Americana and um, Chris Robinson and stuff like that. So we chat about music mostly. But uh, um, she recently did post um, about this poet who was, I think, a bit of a cult poet in the uh, late 70s and 80s. Um, and, you know, like was considered part of the new wave of the new voices of poetry um, at that point and was you know kind of really into sort of uh, he, he talked about Bowie a lot and stuff like that so I kind of thought oh, that sounds really interesting I've not, ne never heard of him and I found that this this which was his debut collection um, is in print and translated in the UK so I ordered it I liked it um, it did feel to me like a very sort of young person's first collection and it had you know like a lot of the same sort of themes about um you know, just observations and kind of very introverted kind of thoughts and feelings. Uh, it's difficult with poetry because you don't know uh, what's lost or gained in translation, but I enjoyed it. I, it didn't really stick with me. Um, I think maybe uh, culturally really important in his time and place and, you know, 
I'm sure it has a, a huge sort of following uh, in, I think it's Norway, in Norway, let's say. Um, oh, next I read, this is a, a Christmas present from Sean, The Hunters by James Salter. This was just, I knew from the beginning this was going to be like a five-star read. It was just so profoundly well written you know like um i love james salter i've read a few of his books um and he does write incredibly well that you just feel in really safe hands um uh, but i've never really really loved his books previous to this i think this was his first novel so i think it's like from the 50s and it's about i guess uh, fairly autobiographical about his experience fighting in like the uh, being a pilot uh, during the second world war does that sound right? Is it Second World War or is it like... Uh, Korean War. Yeah. Korean War, yeah, that did sound right. Korean War. Uh, oh, gosh, so good. So good. Like, such a, like, a uh, well-paced kind of character study. This guy gets sort of transferred to this new base. Um, you get, like, a certain amount of flights you have to go on before you can sort of, you know, retire from from the war. Um, and it sort of goes through his whole time there where he's like the new guy um, they're, they're not sort of seeing much action and he's like the new hope and it's just about his time so he, he doesn't get any kills and he's sort of going along and every time he goes up you know he doesn't find any uh, enemy planes and he has to come back and then there's this, this, uh, this kind of cocky kind of smug guy that sort of enters his sort of battalion and um, he just starts like finding all these fighter planes, shooting them down, and he becomes like a hero. And like, just your hatred for this character is so real. And it's just, it's so good. Um, yeah, so Sean bought me this, um, I guess knowing that I like James Salter, but also because um, Jeff, Sean's favorite from Book Riot, the, the podcast, um, it's his kind of go-to rec recommendation book for dads. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, if you have a dad in your life, um, <laughs> <laughs> definitely buy him this it's so good um, so yeah five five stars that's going to be on my end of year list okay. even though it's sort of an early read yeah uh, and then we buddy read um, Reluctant Immortals oh. by uh, <laughs> Gwendolyn Keist we did a, did we do a, a vlog we about this vlog we did a vlog that. about that we can link that below if you want it was a <laughs> set in uh, in Hollywood in the 60s in LA in the 60s but it was the um, Lucy from Dracula and Bertha from Jane Eyre uh, were, were are somehow like immortals vampires and it, we catch them in 60s LA um, they're living together Dracula comes back um, so they drop one of his urns and he comes back the, the guy that eats the flies comes back. Mr. Rochester. Mr. Rochester comes back as some kind of like cult guru leader. It was really awful. Well, no explanation um, for why why they were no, all immortal. No. Why Mr. Rochester was hanging out with Dracula. Yeah. So I think this is, you know, there is a current sort of trend, I guess, of um, saving these uh, lesser known female characters f that have come, you know, that have. Um, Giving them a voice, you know, like a, you know, rewriting the history. But the thing is, it's, like, it's not really history, is it? It's like they're just they're made <laughs> up from a book. So I think let's let's uh, lift voices of actual people that maybe you know haven't got stories to tell, rather than just rehashing like Dracula all the time and Jane Eyre and. Oh. Yeah, it's not even obscure, isn't it? I no, think yeah. it would be yeah. so, saying something if it was like some yeah. maybe obscure or slightly more obscure novel. Yeah, or or anything like that, you know, like yeah. let's give them a voice. It's, you know, yeah. And if, you know, it could be, it can be powerful, but it was yeah. just not in this case. It was know, dreadful, like, wasn't it? It was bad, yeah. yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Gwen. She brought it on herself. That yeah. was, it was terrible. Yeah. Um, so, and then I read uh, My Dead Book by Nate Lippens. You've had quite a good reading, yes. Yeah, yeah, I've had a really good read. I love this book. Again, five stars. Um, Nate Lippens. I think this is his first book, uh, his first novel anyway. It was kind of quite experimental. It was very um, sort of autofiction um, and quite a short sort of um, book. And he's kind of recalling 
friends and lovers and people that he's known for his life and uh, mostly those that have sort of passed from AIDS, HIV, um, and people that he's lost along the way, drugs. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it, I guess it sounds quite sort of morose, um, but I, I, I just thought it was brilliant. Uh, it's, for me, it's like a new one in the canon, you know, um, of, of, you know, that sort of generation that have lived through um, the 80s and the AIDS pandemic and, and you know, like, a, and it's just a, a survival kind of story, I guess, and what that means to sort of carry these people with you for the rest of your life when they've gone. Um, so, yeah, a beautifully written, really uh, examined life kind of book, you know. Then, uh, and I like it to read. Yeah. Shan liked it too. I liked it too. Yeah. I didn't, I liked it as much as you did. Yeah. I enjoyed it, but I didn't have, yeah, I get four stars. Yeah. But Nate Lippin seems delightful. Doesn't He's he? wonderful yeah. on Instagram, yeah. yeah. And yeah, just We're really friends good. with him on Instagram now. I mean, practically friends in real life, I'd Probably, say. Like yeah. BFFs, maybe. Yeah. Nate. You and Nate, I think, would have nice times together. Oh, definitely, we'd hang yeah. out. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Um, and then I read uh, Selected Poems of Linda Pastan. So I, I think I mentioned previously that I found this in uh, Troutmark, which is like a second-hand um, bookshop, the same day that I found out about her. So uh, in that, that morning, I was um, just looking into sort of various poets um, that I hadn't read anything by, and the name Linda Pastan came up. Uh, and it sort of seemed, you know, destined, because then I went out and... Uh, I found this uh, selected poems, which was a collection from taken from her first four collections, and those were the books that I was kind of interested in. So, sort of seventies, early eighties. Um, I don't remember a huge amount about them, but I had a great time reading it. It was really good uh, poetry. Um, she also, I think, passed quite recently, uh, uh, so I just felt like um, maybe I was supposed to read these poems um, at this point. You know, but uh, yeah, really, really good poet. Um, you go online and have a look, uh, see if you like her style. But uh, I really did. And then I read a graphic novel. And this is called Yeah. And it's by um, Peter Bag, and uh, it's illustrated by Gilbert Hernandez. So I really like Gilbert Hernandez's um, illustration style. Um, and Peter Bag, I'd not heard of, but um, Sarah from Hardcover Hearts. Um, DM'd me and said that she knew of him and he was a bit of a kind of a grunge um, illustrator uh, we're kind of known for sort of a much heavier um, sort of comic series that he did during the sort of the grunge era about that sort of time and place so I guess Seattle um, and this was kind of a, a thing that he did after that and a sort of a bit of a lesser known I guess it had flopped a bit um, and it's much more sort of um, poppy kind of pop arty kind of fun um collection of comics and he's just put them all together in this sort of anthology and it's about um a band like um there's a, a girl group called yeah and it kind of follows their exploits now they're they're kind of a massive like uh failure on planet earth but um they're like the biggest band in the universe everywhere else so all the other planets like they've got a massive alien fan base um, but they can't tell anyone on Earth about that because, you know, people don't know, Earth don't, don't, don't know about the other planets and aliens <laughs> and stuff. So it's kind of their secret, but every time they sort of have come back to Earth, they have to play these really crappy gigs with their... And they've got, like, nemesis bands. And, uh, yeah, it's good. It's got their manager is a bit of a flake. Uh, it's just really fun. you got sort of got to know the individual person personalities in the band. There's, like, a backstory in one of the issues. Um, so it was just, like, yeah, super fun kind of... Uh, kind of a, you know I guess sort of a take on sort of the riot girl but making it sort of really sort of fizzy and funny kind of uh, quite light hearted um, so yeah that was, that was good um, enjoyed that I think I gave that a four out of five so that's January Woo. Uh, February my first read was I Want this is uh, another book I found in Troutmark it's by Nell Dunn and Adrian Henry so they're both great aren't they I mean, especially Nell Dunn um, and this was sort of co-written. I, I I don't know anything. I didn't know anything about this book. I found it, it was a really nice edition. I don't know if I can find the right picture, but that's the edition. Um, and it, yeah, it's about a relationship, um, and it's kind of told in letters and the odd bit of conversation. And it covers like almost like a lifetime of these two almost would-be lovers that um, never quite 
kind of settled with each other. It was a bit on and off, and they went off and married and had other relationships and stuff. But throughout their life, they kind of kept in touch. It was quite sort of... Um, it's quite sad, because um, it goes right up to the end of their lives, and they still haven't kind of committed to each other, I guess. It's kind of like... You can imagine, like, a normal people, but, like, for, like, the sort of early 70s counterculture um, generation. It was a bit like that. It was like... You really wanted them to, to end up together... Um, they kept making sort of frustrating choices. Um, uh, the book itself wasn't great. I think it was a bit of an experiment, you know, between these two writers doing a collab. Um, and you couldn't really tell who wrote who, what bits and stuff, so that worked, I guess. Um, yeah, I'm glad I read it. Uh, it hasn't really stuck with me, so maybe I've got three, three stars, I'd say, for that one. Um, then I read A Woman's Battles and Transformations by Edouard Louis. Oh, I need to read more by it. Um, I was, uh, I'd heard of, um, was it The End of Eddie? And The History of Violence, I think, were by him. So he's sort of you know, really highly regarded. I think he's sort of really big in France. And this was just um, him writing about his mum. Uh, so it was just a very personal little book. Um, and it started off by, I think, him finding, like he found this old photograph of his mum in her 20s looking really sort of carefree and she's like smoking a cigarette and he kind of it, I think it sort of jolted him because it it's not like really the mum he grew up knowing because she was in this um horrible relationship with his dad which was quite abusive and I think it's kind of a tale of how she was really sort of her personality was really boxed in for years um, and then uh, you know how, like, how she got out of that relationship, and she sort of flourished and thrived. Um, and it's, it's just a really sort of tender kind of little study of his mum, and I found a lot of uh, like resonances, I guess, between like my relationship with my mum and sort of seeing them as like you know survivors and getting to know them as people as you get older, you know, as like real human people. Uh, so yeah, I would recommend you know if you're into like a good. Uh, thoughtful short read um, with a lot of heart uh, quite raw as well so you know be wary um, yeah that was good and that was, a, that was a Christmas present from my friend Rosie so thanks Rosie um, you might recall February was uh, the plan for February was to do February rereads. Oh yeah, yeah. We made a whole big deal. About I made it. a whole big deal about it mainly because I like the sound of the, <laughs> the title. Uh, but I did. I, I do. I do intend. So I've still got my my little stack of books that I want to read. I, and I, I'm going to spread it out through the, through the year because what happened was I read Hangover Square. I reread Hangover Square by Patrick Hamilton, um, and it made me really anxious and it put me on a bit of a downer. I still think it's a brilliant book, and if not, if nothing else, I kind of preferred it. Now I sort of saw more in it this this second read. So, as a project, it was a, a huge success because um, I I have seen that maybe rereading something, especially something that you read a certain way in your twenties. For me, like now in my forties, like reading it and sort of, I guess having a, a slightly different perspective um, really helps. Uh, so, if you don't know. Hangover Square. Patrick Hamilton was like, was a uh, you know best-selling author in his day, and he wrote like um, The Rope, which was you know a really big play, and Alfred Hitchcock made into a film. I really like him. I think he's a great writer. And this is about uh, a guy called is it Charlie Bone or Harvey Bone, um, who you see from the beginning has um, he he has these episodes where he's just he has like a click in his brain. And he goes into what he sort of describes as like these sort of dark, sort of dead phases. Um, and when he's in these dead phases, uh, he doesn't really feel anything. So I, 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 I was sort of struggling to sort of work out exactly what Patrick Hamilton was doing with that, which I didn't really sort of question at all. I think the first time I was reading it, I was sort of, is he talking about like um, like depressive episodes or like manic depression or um, is it related to his drinking because he's like drinking consistently like throughout the book um uh and it's he's infatuated with this um woman who is quite possibly the meanest <laughs> most hateable character i've ever come across in fiction 
Um, so I remember think, feeling sort of similar the first time I read it, but this time I was like, oh my gosh, she's awful. And her friend, her friends are awful, her whole group are awful. And um, something that well, I'd probably just forgotten from the first time I was reading it, it was like they're all kind of, so this is set just prior to the Second World War, it's set in like 1930, late, late, late 30s. Um, and they're really sort of depicted as, like, they're sort of fasc fascist sympathisers. So it's in, you know, London. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that that element is like throughout the book, which I, I don't remember and I maybe didn't pick up the first time around, but there's a real sort of, uh, I guess, discussion of fascism going on. Um, she's, you know, beautiful, but she's really mean and she's like a real user. So she kind of only tolerates uh, Harvey because he's got a little bit of money, you know, she likes boozing and he would take her out to restaurants every now and again, but she's just a social climber. She has no interest in him. Uh, and he knows that, but he just keeps like trying and trying and it's, it's like unbearable. Um, anyway, so he keeps having these like little clicks and they're getting more and more prominent throughout the novel, which is like my anxiety level <laughs> every time he went into these dead, dead zones. When he's in the dead zones, he remembers, oh, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be killing her. Uh, and he's like, I'll do it now. And then like, he sort of starts, you know, doing his plan of like, I'll, I'll go here and I'll kill her, and then, and then I'm gonna sort of escape. And then he'll click again. And he'll be back in the life where he's just like her lap dog kind of thing. And it's just, it's so great. It's such a frustrating, horrible uh, novel. Please, someone out there, read it. Or if you've read it, let's chat about it. Did it make you feel horribly depressed too? Um, so I think because of that experience, I looked at my pile that I picked for rereads and they're all kind of quite bleak. So I, I, I'll, I'll put them aside for now. I'll get to them later. Did it give you tummy ache? It did yeah, actually, Brad. physically. <laughs> I don't know if I'm, because I'm getting older now. I'm, I'm quite old. And um, I get Hello. physical responses to things that I, I maybe didn't note before or just didn't have before. But like, it made me feel like... Um, bloated <laughs> which you know i get when i'm anxious it's like it's just everything like my whole body was like affected by by reading that so i think like you have to be careful what you consume you know like movies music books um because they you know you, your body absorbs them in some weird way you know so you're not really careful with films you watch you watch well, I watch a lot of crap yeah. so i don't feel anything <laughs> which is my you know my ideal space really Final book of February, oh, actually, no, not really, um, was I Never Promised You a Rose Garden. This is by Manny Murphy, who is described as a genderqueer author. I, I couldn't really sort of get much more information um, uh, other than that. This is a, this is great. It's a graphic novel, um, but it has a really sort of specific sort of style. So like each page is kind of like, you know, those books where you used to have like the picture, you do the picture on top and you do the writing underneath, kind of like that. And they're all done in one kind of pictures. Um painted ink pictures and you can sort of see how like they've seeped through the pages and then you sort of turn the page and you can kind of see how it's come through i loved that i thought it was great and it was really sort of um unique sort of style um and it starts off about uh the author's re sort of recollections of being really obsessed with river phoenix so sean read this one a while ago you might remember um and especially like uh my own private idaho and Gus Van Zandt. So it sort of starts off as this kind of, a bit of kind of remembering this crush or this sort of um, being a fan and being like a bit infatuated with River Phoenix. Sort of then sort of sprawls out into this uh, history of uh, Portland, Oregon, where the author grew up and uh, how it's sort of steeped in uh, white supremacy how the whole sort of basis of, uh, you know, white settlers is because they um, moved in on indigenous land, sort of deliberately um, infected them with, you know, like all, all these kind of viruses which they had no immunity against. And how like the whole history throughout um, has, has been sort of steeped in this kind of white supremacy sort of ideology, how politicians have been, you know, part of the Ku Klux Klan and... And it was, it was quite a heavy, um, but really interesting sort of history of the era. And I really liked that, how it sort of started off as one thing and then sort of sprawled out and then sort of went back in, uh, sort of both personal and kind of political. 
uh, graphic novel. It was great. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I, 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 I do love My Own Private Idaho. I haven't seen it since I was a teenager, though. So it did kind of make me want to rewatch that. So Keanu's in that. Um, although like Gus Van Zandt, I think, is just massively problematic. Um, yeah, and it had loads of stuff about um, the Matt Dillon uh, drugstore cowboy, which is with Matt Dillon. He's playing this this real life guy who's like a street kid that was also kind of a massive sort of Nazi kind of white supremacist. Um, and how they went on uh, is it Geraldo, the, the sort of the chat show in America. And so it was, just had loads of stuff going on in there. It was, it was great. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in the other book I'll mention because I sort of finished this on the first of March, but I've sort of been reading it for most of February. Was um, the Wichita Lineman by Dylan Jones. Uh, this is a whole book about the song Wichita Lineman, um, specifically the uh, original kind of you know Glen Campbell version uh, written by Jimmy Webb. And it was really interesting, really fascinating, and really sort of evoked the song really well. And, you know, it's it's an incredible song. It's just endlessly fascinating. It's one of those songs that you don't necessarily notice until you notice it. Um, so it's about the whole sort of background of both of those guys, Jimmy Webb and uh, Glenn Campbell, um, how they were, like, really sort of deep friends, like... Um, but had completely different sort of ideologies. Like Dan Campbell was this kind of quite sort of, you know, uh, uh, old school country singer. He was sort of right wing. He, you know, was heavily sort of into sort of alcohol and cocaine and religion. Um, and Jimmy Webb was this kind of uh, left wing hippie sort of coming up through sort of L.A. and hanging out with Joni Mitchell and, and how they kind of uh, those two ideologies kind of created this kind of almost like perfect song which kind of almost sort of leans both ways uh, it really made me think about the song anyway which is you know it's just like a short little song unfinished because he didn't write a third verse because he was just like he, he, had, he had to write it really quickly he was like, asked to write it and write, write a song about a place um, because he'd written it's just too much info uh, I can geek out about music forever. <laughs> um, by the time we get to Phoenix, he'd, he'd done first, and Glenn had had a hit with that. Um, and they said, write another place uh, song, and he just kind of had like the day to write it in, and he sort of sent it off, you know, kind of unfinished, so they had this bit in the middle. Um, but it's kind of perfect because of that. Uh, and it has like, a history of the place. Do you know what put me off? So I, I only ended up giving this three stars. I... I, I Dylan Jones is an author that I've uh, I've struggled with previously, uh, and so he, he writes for GQ. There's hardly any mention of women at all in this book, like no women musicians, and like uh, he's just you know constantly throwing sort of music references at you. It's just like that kind of like not even sort of realizing maybe that he was just writing this really blokey, you know, sausage heavy book, <laughs> and then. Um, he was writing about a playlist that he was making for a road trip across America. He put Ed Sheeran on one of them. <laughs> I was just like, I can't, I'm, I can't believe I'm reading a book by someone that likes Ed Sheeran, let alone a music book. Um, that lost a star for me. Um, and then I think he um, he mentioned someone else that annoyed me. Anyway, I don't, oh, I, I don't rate. <laughs> Dylan Jones' taste <laughs> that much although he did write about which style men really well oh yeah Alex James Ooh. he kept talking about Alex James and how Alex James really loves the song I like, I don't want to read about Alex James either no. don't throw like Tory Alex James at me Tory Cheesemakers Tory Cheesemakers at me um, this is you know my ha my home so I don't want them in my home he was writing about like Alex James and Ed Sheeran he could have yeah. written about women couldn't he it's not like it was yeah, it's I mean, not, you're not just writing anyway. about like yeah. uh, you know like a specific type of music yeah. or anything. Um, so anyway, yeah, it, it, it's an interesting book. I'm, I got it out of the library, so I'm glad I got it out of the library because it, uh, I got a lot from it. Um, yeah, should we discuss? Do you want to discuss Wichita Lineman with me? <laughs> it's it's like it is like a fine like a cheese or like a fine wine that I think like the more you listen to it, it seems to improve and like it's timeless. It doesn't sound like it came out in 1968 it doesn't it sort of belongs in its own little world um, with this guy fixing the telephone wire you know 
Anyway, uh, yeah, quite a long video of me chatting to you. I hope that's alright. Um, still got a bit of hot chocolate, so I'm going to finish that. Uh, yeah, let's see you soon, and let's chat down below. Bye.